We struggle to hear each other. We are so entrenched in our own thoughts and our own beliefs, however right we think they are, that we can't hear what, where the pain is on someone else's uh, side. Now, it doesn't mean that they're right, but we don't even listen. So the nitty gritty, difficult and revolutionary practice of relationship building has just gone by the wayside. Reverend Leah Daughtry is a political strategist, author, and the only person to twice be the CEO of the Democratic National Convention. I sat down with Leah at her family's church in Brooklyn, a place steeped in activism, to discuss 2020 presidential candidates, the fight for voting rights, and her new book, For Coloured Girls Who Have Considered Politics. You co-wrote this book with three other very powerful, very prominent black women, Donna Brazile, Yolanda Carraway, and Mignon Moore. Why did you feel it was so important to distill all of your histories into one book as opposed to, you know, separating them out? You could have each had a memoir. You know, I think, uh, one, because we wanted to share about the power of friendship and what's possible when people come together and on a, for a common purpose, a common cause, and choose to row in the same direction. Which is not to say we agree on everything because we're girlfriends <laughs> and we don't. But on the big issues uh, of the day, we can come together and, and decide this is what we think works for our community, mm -hmm. what will yield the best results for our community. We've been in this business now, all of us, 30 plus years, and we said we should share uh, what we've learned, both from a historic perspective, but as women are rising and climbing up the political ladder, and not just politics, business, education, industry. When you were on, on your coming up, obviously we know a bit about your history, but coming up, what were some of the biggest hurdles you faced? You know, it's particularly in politics, when I was coming up, there weren't a lot of women. A lot, there weren't a lot of women role models. And so one of the things we learned early is that uh, your, your biggest champions, role models, mentors, may not look like you, because they were just simply weren't. Uh, we were the only black women in the space with a couple of such C. Dolores Tucker and Maxine Waters, but there were, weren't people at the DNC that we could say, hey, how do you navigate this process? So our champions became white men who were willing to invest time, energy, effort in helping us uh, navigate the system, understand the rules, work inside the tent. Um, so that was one of the biggest uh, lessons we had to learn that mentors can mentors may not look like you. You know, I mean, you were the CEO of the Democratic Convention 2008 and 2016. How has the political landscape shifted? You know, from the time that you were CEO of the the Democratic Convention in 2008, what you had was interestingly um, juxtaposition to 2016. You had a. a a newcomer, Barack Obama, and a person who'd been in the game for a long time, Hillary Clinton. Barack Obama brought a ton of new people into the process, and folks who begin paying attention to how nominations are structured and how you win a nomination, he went on to win. In 2016, you had the same dynamic, a newcomer, Bernie Sanders, against a, a long-timer, Hillary Clinton. Bernie brought a lot of people into the party, but he wasn't able to convert that into a win. So it's an interesting juxtaposition of the two races and why the newcomer was able to win the first time, but not the second time. You talk about this in the book as well, but you have had your own experiences with Bernie Sanders and the way that he has sort of interacted with the Democratic Party and with the apparatus of sort of the, the Democratic Party. What do you think about Bernie Sanders and his kind of attempts at the moment to try and make amends for not just accusations of sexual harassment that were kind of in his campaign, but also the way that he is trying to seemingly make amends when it comes to racial balance? So I put my party leader hat on for, for this. I think he has uh, some good ideas. I think he's obviously been reelected by the people of Vermont several times mm -hmm. to serve. And so they clearly have some trust in him. I'd like to see a Democrat be the Democratic nominee. And so I would say to Senator Sanders, welcome to the party. If you want to join, we'd be happy to have you. But I'm not comfortable with people who are not members who haven't made the investment of membership in our party seeking to be the standard bearer of the party. So I'm looking forward to uh, Senator Sanders if he chooses to put his hat in the ring. We have new rules now that say that you have to be a Democrat in order to seek the Democratic nomination. You have to sign an attestation that you are a Democrat, that you will run as a Democrat, and you will serve as a Democrat. Hopefully uh, looking forward to him signing that and, and joining the party if that's what he chooses to do. But if he chooses to do that, I mean, there'll be people that will say he's doing it purely for the political expediency of, of yeah, the whole thing. I'm, I mean, I'm, could you trust him, I suppose? 
place. You know, I, I think people will say that, but I think uh, I would I would be one that would want to take him at his word. Kamala Harris threw her hat in the ring and already there's birtherism. I mean, yeah. did you imagine that we were going to be talking about birtherism again? I think given the tone and the tenor of the country under the current president, what has been unleashed and permitted uh, under, the, under the current presidency, and the fact that America has not fully dealt with the challenges of race and had a full and open conversation about race. Yes, I imagined it could happen again. I am not shocked at all. She's, she announced in the very next day, we're talking about who her parents are and whether they were, whether they were citizens. And you have a national television correspondent saying it's, the onus is on her to prove she's American. We're not asking that of anyone else. And there are other people who have declared, has anyone asked any of the others to prove that they are American? It's, it's unconscionable, but not surprising. Race is already starting to play a big role in 2020. We're not even there yet. But you have candidates like Elizabeth Warren, like Kirsten Gillibrand coming out and saying, I'm gonna be listening more intently. A lot of over courting of black voters already. Do you find it genuine? You know, I, I, I love hearing it all, but I think the actions are what really matter. So you can talk about inclusiveness and representation, but if your staff's not inclusive and representative, then it's just all words. So I've, I've been really gratified with this first round of folks who have announced that they are announcing diverse teams of people uh, to be part of their staffs. I think all of the candidates, especially particularly on the Democratic side, understand that you cannot win the nomination without the African-American vote. And African-American women in particular are the most loyal, most consistent voting bloc in the nation, especially among Democrats. We turn out, we vote, we know how to size up a candidate, and we show up at the polls, we don't miss. So you, it's really hard to think about winning any state where there is a significant African-American population without uh, uh, courting us. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think they, we, they've realized it. Doug Jones won the Senate race on the strength of African-American women voters. And now we have new black women in Congress. Mm -hmm. And the diversity of the new Congress uh, really points to the power of the vote. So if you want to win, just as a strategic, as a strategic uh, tactic, you've got to go where the votes are. Yeah. And, and, and you're not going to win our vote if you're not going to have a campaign that's representative of our issues. Are you worried at all that there's going to be sort of a incorrect course correction be, by the Democratic Party because of the voters in some of the Midwestern states and you know places like Pennsylvania and things like that, that Trump won. I mean, that there was such a big furore when Hillary lost that, well, she flew past those states. She didn't appeal to white working class people. You know, not really, because when you look at the numbers, Hillary lost uh, the presidential by about 78,000 votes across three states. Mm -hmm. So we're not talking about huge margins here. And when you factor in the Russian interference in the election, uh, what we, we now know and what Mueller is uncovering every day, the, inf the interference of a foreign government in our electoral process. I, I don't know that there really is uh, that how much of a valid claim uh, you can really make on we lost the white working class voters. 78,000 votes across three states. In the scheme of the millions of people who voted, it's a very small margin. Here's the other thing I would argue. The issues that concern African American voters, uh, education, the safety in our communities, uh, livable streets, affordable housing, are not issues for black people. They're issues for all Americans. And, you know, Reverend Jackson used to say, when, when America gets a cold, black America gets pneumonia. So, when, so if, if, we're, if those are the things that we're, where we're feeling the brunt, yeah. everybody else is feeling the same brunt. And so to make them racial issues or to make it that black people care about a set of issues that no one else cares about is, I think, a faulty premise. How big do you think that the Stacey Abrams issues and voter suppression issues are going to be in this election? I mean, do you see it as actually having an indelible mark on 2020? I think Stacey was robbed. Uh, when you have the person in the game also refereeing the game who also wrote the rules for the game, there's something 
really unjust about that. Uh, and we know that votes weren't counted. We know that there were arbitrary rules that uh, kept absentee ballots from being counted and so forth. And she's taking that on as an issue. She's called, I think she's called it Fair Fight Georgia. And so she's really taking on voter suppression, voter intimidation tactics as, as something that she's rallying around. And I think we watched that and we knew it was wrong. We knew it was wrong and we knew in, in polling places across the country that people were having challenges voting. And you cannot have a representative democracy if the people aren't represented. And you're not gonna have people represented if they can't vote. That is the fundamental uh, plank of our American system. It's why we left England. <laughs> it's, it's why we left the queen. Fine, you're because welcome. We, <laughs> because we wanted to have a hand in our own destiny. Yeah. And so if we're going to violate that very basic principle and not allow the people to participate in deciding who makes decisions for them, then we have a really fundamental problem. Do you feel like there's going to have to be a rewriting of the Voting Rights Act in a sense? The Congress is already working on that. Thank, thank goodness for Nancy Pelosi and, and the Democrats. One of the first things they did was introduce legislation that would deal with these voting rights and voter suppression issues. What we need is a 21st century Voting Rights Act to really look at the challenges that are, are in play now. That, that when we had did the first one in 1965, we didn't have electronic voting. It wasn't early voting. All of these new technologies have introduced new layers of challenge for our voting system, and we have to deal with them. Uh, and that's what a new Voting Rights Act would do. Obviously, you are a woman of faith. We're sat in the house of God. I, I think that the warmth to this space has kind of been something that is been lost in sort of discourse. I feel like religion in the last few years in particular seems like it's become weaponized because there has been a real focus on very specific kind of evangelicalism and obviously the vice president and he is very particular faith-based views and how they have perhaps either influenced Policy, obviously, you know, we have an administration that has a religious task force. Mm -hmm. That's the first time an administration has had anything of that particular kind before. Do you feel that religion today is actually being weaponized in a, in a negative way as opposed to a positive way? You know, uh, yes, uh, particularly from the right. I really struggle to understand the text that they are basing their, their, their beliefs on because I don't know what Bible they're reading. It's, it's just foreign to me. But you see this weaponization and this, this particularly with Trump, where they are willing to forgive things in him that they would not forgive in Bill Clinton. And they demonize Bill Clinton for whatever perceived wrongs, and Donald Trump gets a pass. And so you just wonder, as, as people of faith, we have one plumb line. We have one standard, and that standard is the word of God, and it goes for everybody. I think for part of the, the rise of the religious right is the fault of the religious left. Because uh, for many of us, black church except, you know, to the side, for many of white uh, Protestantism, white Catholicism on the left, they've chosen to be silent for decades. They've chosen to either dismiss the religious right or uh, sit in their churches and cathedrals and, and hope that prayer and fasting will bring about a, an end. And they chose not to challenge mm. their white brothers and sisters who, uh, whose beliefs are uh, uh, different from the word and the way of God. And so I often say to them, you've got to speak up. Mm. You cannot leave this for black Christians and a social justice ministry to challenge these folks on the right. Your failure to do that has created a vacuum that has allowed these people to rise. And we wouldn't have to be working so hard if we hadn't been silent for so many years. You talk about foundation and values in your book. What do you want people to take away from the book? Aside from female sisterhood and friendship, what are you hoping people take away? I hope people take away that uh, services a great thing and that all of us can serve as Dr. King says, you don't have to be great to serve. You just have to put yourself into it and decide. And I want people to understand that public service is a noble thing. You can do anything. You don't have to, you don't have, to have an auspicious background with, uh, you know, with, with all the bells and whistles. Hard work is a necessary thing. There are no overnight wonders. Overnight wonders often take years to happen.